I was told that I'm supposed to fear the turtle. <laughs> but I'm not, because all of you have been so welcoming, really. I'm really happy to be here at the University of Maryland. But I think there's one person who's much happier than I am to be here, and that's Al Carey, a very proud Maryland graduate. And I really sincerely mean it when I say that the University of Maryland is front and center in PepsiCo because of Al Carey. But to us at PepsiCo, Al is our hero. He runs our beverage business across the Americas, and it's one of the most important businesses in PepsiCo. It's a difficult marketplace and fierce competition, but Al does a brilliant job running that business. And uh, what I don't know is how he manages, manages to run that difficult business, yet remain the world's biggest Maryland athletics fan. He watches every Maryland game. Um, the truth is I cannot imagine what PepsiCo would be without Al. He's been at the company for 35 years, and I've only been there for 21 years. So Al really is one of the uh, longest serving executives in PepsiCo today, right Al? Yeah, in fact, when Al said that, he's now, he's now when Al said um, uh, he joined PepsiCo before many of you got to Maryland, I'd say before many of them were born. <laughs> Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> But just as Al told you about me, I can tell you that I look up to Al. He's an incredible executive, a trusted colleague, but more importantly, a great friend. And um, I could spend all my time here telling stories about Al, and uh, I actually heard a few about his college days, which I won't share them with you. But, um, but when he walked into my office and said, you know, I have a favor to ask of you, could you come up to Maryland and speak to, or come down to Maryland and speak to people there? Um, I said, well, sure, why not? I mean, there's nothing to, it's not a favor. It's my pleasure to be uh, at Maryland. So Al, I actually look at this as a privilege to be here. So thank you for asking me. And even though Al loves PepsiCo, his first love will always be the University of Maryland. And having spent uh, a couple of hours this morning, I can see why Al loves the University of Maryland. I think first there's your mascot, Testudo. <laughs> Sounds like a Frito-Lay snack, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right? Pass me that bag of testudos. <laughs> They're great with salsa. But um, the fact of the matter is, I think Al loves the mascot. We also recruit heavily from uh, Maryland, both the undergraduate and the graduate program. Um, just as uh, Alex just mentioned, Rose Bowman was um, the regional VP uh, for Northeast Beverages. It's one of, the mo one of our most critical and competitive markets. The fact that Rose is going to head it up means uh, Maryland did something good. And uh, more importantly, the University of Maryland is a great customer. You guys just re-upped with PepsiCo, and we will continue to be part of the university community, which means that all of you will have access to the greatest snacks and greatest beverages <laughs> for several more years. Uh, and finally, PepsiCo has sponsored the Chair of Consumer Studies at Smith, held by Professor Weddle. Uh, but if he gives you too much reading, it's not because of us. Blame it on that professor. So PepsiCo is very much part of the University of Maryland, thanks to Al Carey. So let's give Al Carey a wonderful. <laughs> so I will tell you an interesting uh, tidbit. This morning we got on the plane to come here, and I looked at Al and said, Al, what the hell is that tie? Because you know, <laughs> Al always wears the most elegant Ferragamo and Hermes ties. He's Mr. GQ there. And I'm like, what's this tie? Your shirt tie? How does this all match? He said, oh no, but this is my Maryland tie. <laughs> Al, you got to stand up and let everybody see that tie of yours. I got this from the Smith School. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how much he loves the school. But uh, there's one other thing you, uh, about the University of Maryland. One thing that makes it so special that trumps all of that, and that's you. The students of the University of Maryland and your incredible potential. And a potential that comes from one characteristic in particular, and that is your entrepreneurial spirit. Now, some people bristle when they hear the word entrepreneur because they think it's something that talks about people who come up with a lot of ideas but cannot turn them into something more meaningful or real. That's not true because that's not what's happening at the University of Maryland. That's not what Kevin Plank thought. It's not what Sergey Brin thought. And I don't think that's what you think. Now, at this point, you might be sitting there saying, 
what is the CEO of a Fortune 50 consumer packaged company uh, uh, talking about entrepreneurship? Good question. You probably are thinking that entrepreneurship is about the little guy, the garage tinkerer, David going up against the Battle of Goliath. I say no. I think that the view of entrepreneurship is in fact incomplete because entrepreneurs aren't just the young upstarts. They're anyone that's trying to create something out of nothing. They're the people who want to start a project, form an organization, develop a product, build a new system for doing things because the old way of doing things is just not cutting it anymore. And we place great value on these qualities at PepsiCo because they help us keep at the cutting edge and ahead of competition. And you can find these entrepreneurs in every sector, not just business. Because for every company founder, there is an entrepreneur at an NGO or in government coming up with innovative ways to solve society's biggest problems. And that's the reason I'm here talking to you all about entrepreneurship, because we need more of it in every flavor. Because the challenges and the opportunities that we face today are more varied, more complex, and massive than ever before. Global megatrends like climate change and hunger affect all of us. Disruption touches not just business, but communities and societies. And the pace of change is breathtakingly fast. The pace of change is breathtakingly fast because it seems like just last week you were in the ACC. So <laughs> change is fast. So whether you want to bring new ideas to business, nonprofits, or governments, don't hold back because we need you. We need Maryland graduates to be entrepreneurs, which means we need you to work towards a vision for a brighter future to be bold and courageous leaders, and to embrace a diversity of ideas. Because if you combine those characteristics, you can be the kind of entrepreneur that changes the world. So let me talk about the first characteristic of entrepreneurs, their vision. We often talk about entrepreneurs in terms of the products they create or the organizations they begin. But I think entrepreneurship is a lot more than that. It's about a vision for the future. Entrepreneurs don't start out with a line of code. They don't start out with a prototype, at least not the entrepreneurs that I know. They start out with a vision about how, can, how they can change the world or what the world could be. And I think at PepsiCo, as Al mentioned, the whole company operates under this vision of performance with purpose. It's our simple idea that short-term profits need not come at the expense of long-term sustainable growth. And it means that we expand our portfolio of products to include healthier options. It means being a good steward of the environment. And it means truly caring for our employees so they, they feel they're making a living in PepsiCo and having a life. And interestingly, Performance with Purpose is not a one-off corporate social responsibility project. It's baked into every aspect of our company. In fact, it's our vision of how business should operate. And that vision has catalyzed into an astounding number of transformations across the company. So let me give you some examples. It relates to how we dealt with water scarcity in India. Since 2009, our business in India is water positive, which means that our team has managed to conserve more water than we use in order to make our products. Sounds far-fetched, but let me talk about it. In 2013, we used six and a half billion liters of water in our operations in India. And we conserved 17 and a half liters of water. So we are water positive by almost 11 billion liters of water. How do you do that? I mean, how do you conserve more than you use? So we partner with our suppliers to change agricultural practices. We collaborate with the community to build recharge ponds. We build check dams for rainwater harvesting. And we work with the entire community to make sure that they do not allow water, which is a very scarce commodity, to just be wasted. And just because we, PepsiCo, are there, we actually improve the community around us. And India is just the beginning. Little towns in India are just the beginning. The water conservation models we have in India 
are a model for the rest of the company and the rest of the world. Because performance with purpose is not about water or resource management, it's an entrepreneurial vision for the world where we believe that what's good for society is good for business and vice versa. But making that vision a reality is not easy. Whether you're just starting out or you've been in business for 50 years like we have, entrepreneurship requires courageous vision, courageous leadership. That's the second characteristic of entrepreneurs which I'll talk about. In business, there'll always be times when you will have to stick to your vision when the odds are stacked against you and the outcome is uncertain. That's something that we at PepsiCo have a lot of experience in. For a long time, we were known for selling snacks and soft drinks, great tasting snacks and soft drinks. But when I arrived, that strategy was not working so well. But even though we were firing on all cylinders, we came to realize that that was not enough. The strategy was working well, and even though we were firing on all cylinders, I knew it was not enough. Because I saw trends that were happening in the world that seemed to indicate that the trends were going to change, and I realized we had to change with them. So even though products like Pepsi and Lay's were our backbone, we began to expand our portfolio. So back in the late 1990s, we became an early mover in the health and wellness space. And over the past two decades, we have architected a beautiful portfolio of brands that's on trend, well positioned for the future. Don't get me wrong, we still love our Pepsi and Lay's and Mountain Dew, and I'm sure many of you do too. But now we offer so much more like Naked Juice and Quaker and Sabra Hummus, great tasting, extremely healthy products. And I understand Naked Juice is a big favorite on campus, Al. Yeah. And all of that is PepsiCo, the new PepsiCo. A lot of the old fun products, but a whole range of good for you products. But getting to this point was a difficult, difficult journey. There were many that disagreed. They were quite happy with status quo. In fact, I often heard the line, if it ain't broke, why do you want to fix it? I'm sure you heard the same thing when Maryland moved from the ACC. <laughs> the Big Ten is too competitive. You'll never win. You're messing with tradition. I heard it all. Just as you reached the conference semifinals and earned the number four seed in the NCAA tournament and put up a great fight this weekend, we too went down to business. I must say, just as Maryland is doing just fine, at least on the women's basketball side, and you know, the women have arrived. Al, the women have arrived. Just as Maryland is doing fine, so is our nutrition business. Today it accounts for 20% of our revenue. We're one of the top companies in the world in the area of everyday nutrition. And the company has never been in a stronger position. But I can tell you that what it took to get from where we were to where we are today was extremely painful. The lesson then is this. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be willing to be bold. You've got to have the courage of your convictions. And you've got to stay focused on the bigger picture. Because if you don't, believe me, there'll be enough obstacles on the way that you'll just never reach where you want to get to. People will fight you every step of the way. But if you don't step up and do it, who will? So it's, as an entrepreneur, it's up to you to provide bold and courageous leadership. But as you do all of that, always embrace a diversity of ideas. And that's the third element of entrepreneurship. Because entrepreneurs are not in search of their idea. They're in search of the best idea. Think about all of the startups in Silicon Valley. The whole concept of Silicon Valley revolves around the idea of founders coming together to work and share ideas. I mean, we've often talked about Silicon Valley being the best example of sort of cooperation, where people compete with each other and cooperate with each other. Now, our headquarters in Purchase, New York, is a long ways from Mountain View and San Francisco. But that same culture of diversity of thought exists in PepsiCo. Because to us, diversity is much more than gender or, diversity or ethnicity. Diversity for us is welcoming and supporting a wide variety of backgrounds, experiences, 
and most importantly, supporting a wide variety of points of view. And that's what allows you to approach a problem from every possible angle. And it's how you unco uncover insights that would have been otherwise lost. When you form these new connections and build these new relationships, you can produce some astoundingly creative entrepreneurial ideas. So let me tell you one last story. A few years ago, we formed a unique partnership with the Inter-American Development Bank and a group of smallholder farmers. These are farmers with ownership of just a few hectares each. So the question is, what's PepsiCo doing partnering with the Inter-American Development Bank and smallholder farmers? Well, along with the Inter-American Development Bank, we saw an opportunity to spur local sunflower seed production, which has basically been sort of dormant in the region. And if we encourage farmers to plant sunflower, we would buy the seeds, we would squeeze the seeds to get sunflower oil, and sunflower oil is a heart-healthy oil. So if we fried our chips in heart-healthy oil, hey, we've just made our chips that much better. So what did we do? Working with the Inter-American Development Bank, we gave those farmers loans, they planted the sunflower, and we guaranteed the offtake of the sunflower and the seeds, and we got a ready source of heart healthy oil for our chips. So it is a virtuous circle. So by embracing that diversity of ideas from Inter-American Development Bank, these smallholders, and the wide range of partners, we put into action an entrepreneurial idea that was good for business, good for consumers, and good for society. I know this is something all of you at the University of Maryland appreciate because I understand it's second nature here to embrace and share in the diversity of ideas. Which is why I'm confident that when you go off into whatever sector or field you choose, you won't close yourself off. You will embrace diverse opinions and experiences. And never forget that skill that you learned at the University of Maryland because you're gonna need it for the rest of your life. Because contrary to popular opinion, greatness is not an individual pursuit. It is not an individual pursuit. But it does start with you. So I ask you, the visionaries, the leaders, the diverse thinkers of the University of Maryland, what kind of future do you want? What technological innovation will you unleash on the world that will make all our lives better? What social program will you build that fixes the problems that affect not just a few, but many? What new disruptive company will you start? Or what established company will you change? I've been told that there are a few people at Smith who are considering offers from PepsiCo. Any of them here? Show of hands. Okay. It says, yeah, I won't call you out, but I just did. <laughs> <laughs> so the question for all of you is, do you want to come and be entrepreneurs with PepsiCo? I'll give you until the end of the session to decide. <laughs> but not longer than that. The world, is, the world is moving fast, and some of you might think you've got to be in a small company to be an entrepreneur. Not true. PepsiCo is a company with an incredible entrepreneurial spirit, and you can choose how to change PepsiCo as you come into our company. Because society may shift and transform, the one thing that won't change is the demand for new, big ideas everywhere. So we need entrepreneurial thinking from people like the students at the University of Maryland in PepsiCo. So to all of you, I say, go out there, be entrepreneurs, and make those ideas a reality. And because Al made me promise, I'll end with this. Go Terps. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. We wanted to take a little bit of time for some um, Q&A. And uh, I have prepared a few questions. They're the easy ones uh -huh. because you know where to find me. And then the tough questions are going to come from the crowd. I'll find them too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you will. Um, actually, as I, as I was just looking down, I think you've actually addressed a lot of these. But let me just uh, pick a couple, and then we'll uh -huh. open it up to the audience. 
Um, you talked a little bit about diversity, mm -hmm. and um, most companies these days are talking about diversity. The challenge of inclusiveness is one that I don't think has been um, uh, settled all that well. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, best practices at PepsiCo in inclusiveness and how you can do that with such a large organization. Not easy. Because I tell you, if I go back to our own journey from several years ago, uh, we started this journey on diversity. And we needed to start the journey with diversity because we needed to improve our balance of you know, people inside the company. As Al mentioned, it used to be a good old uh, boys network. And when I came to PepsiCo in 94, I remember several people calling me and saying, why do you want to join PepsiCo? It's called Pepsi Pretty. And you don't belong there. Not because I wasn't pretty, that's not what they were meaning. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I rationalized myself. But basically what they were saying is you don't fit the mold of the person that's at PepsiCo. And what are you doing there and why do you want to go there? There's so many other companies you can go to. But for some reason, there was a soul in the company I wanted to be a part of. But I can tell you there were so many meetings I was the only woman. And it was tough at times because the guys had their own code, they had their own looks. They had their own fist bumps, you know? All of that stuff which us women were not part of. And over time, we realized we had to do two things. First, we had to get a critical mass of diversity into the company in terms of the numbers. So step one was, how do you actually incentivize and measure how many people are coming into PepsiCo? And the second part is, how do you create the environment so that they all felt included into the company? Because how can you practice inclusion if you don't have enough people to practice on? Right? So we just needed to get the people in. And inclusion doesn't happen because you tell people, I want you to all of a sudden become inclusive when you were not before. Um, so we had to go through training. I think we had inclusion one, inclusion two, inclusion three training. And in each training program, we had instructors who taught all of us in groups how we behaved, how we talked, how we should behave, and how we should talk. Because, for example, sometimes it would be jokes on, a particular ethnic group or gender, people didn't even realize these jokes were going around. Or insensitive comments about some group, nobody even realized they were making those comments. So there were actors who would act out scenes of situations. Um, and so by role modeling all of this, by making us go through waves of inclusion training, and then firing those people who didn't live up to those values of inclusion, we actually changed the environment in PepsiCo. And today, I think in PepsiCo, we would say we are on our way to making sure our employee base reflects our consumer base. So if the consumer base is 50% women, we should get to 50% women in the company, right? So our employee base should reflect our consumer base. And I'll go a step further and say, if 85% of food and beverage decisions are made by women, we have a long ways to go <laughs> out. <laughs> so the future is great for DNI and i and PepsiCo, but it was a long journey, tough journey. Great. Well, we're in a business school, so I have to ask you a question about business schools. You've uh -huh. graduated from two of the best, uh, uh -huh. from IIM Calcutta and from Yale. And you've obviously hired a lot of and, and worked with a lot of MBA grads and, and undergraduate business grads. So I'm curious in terms of as we develop um, competencies for the future worker, uh, what you see as perhaps shortcomings in terms of how we're educating business school students, or just generally what kind of competencies we should be spending more time trying to develop to produce more value for a company like uh, PepsiCo. And whatever I say, you won't be offended, Alex. I will not. <laughs> OK. Um, and this is not something I'm saying to the University of Maryland. I say this of all business schools. And let me give you an example. Uh, my niece is, gradu is graduating from the Harvard Business School. And you know, in her first year, they must have done 10 PepsiCo cases. Okay, So she'd call me and she'd ask me a question about a PepsiCo case, because she was uh, asked by her professor to call her aunt to get answers. Okay? <laughs> because they're not allowed to call insiders. Okay, right. So she had to get permission. But it made me pause and think something. She's done 10 cases on PepsiCo in two semesters, plus 30 other cases. But any PepsiCo issue is not something you address in two hours. I mean, we take years to address the issue. It's got enormous depth. What are we doing with these kids? We're just allowing them to skate 
over issues. Okay? The best example I'll give you is the following. What we teach our students in business school, by and large, is make money at all costs. If you get into trouble, hire somebody from the law school. If you need an environmental problem to be addressed, call somebody from the environmental school. If all else fails, call the divinity school to pray for you. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. I think we have to get to a situation where we take the caseload down. And we say, if there's an issue, let's get the professor from the political science department to come and talk about the politics of the country that this issue came up in. Let's get the professor from the environment school to talk about the environmental issues around the case. Let's get the professor from the law school to come and talk about the legal underpinnings of this case, of this case the corporate governance issues. Let's get people from the company to come and talk about this issue because most cases are written from a rear view mirror perspective, right? So get people from the company. Let's take a case and spend two weeks, three weeks on this case, really digging into the details. I think if we did that, the kids would have a much better perspective of the depth of the issues as opposed to, I think right now, we just very superficially run through issues. And that means business schools have to change the way faculty is willing to behave. Because in many cases, I'll observe, and I've said this to Ted Snyder at SOM, at Yale, um, most of the faculty teach uh, boundaryless management of boundaryless organizations. They tell you, tell the students, it's got to be seamless, never operate in silos. The place that operates with the biggest silos is universities. So I think we have to break them all down. We have to become seamless. And I say this for Yale. I don't know about how Maryland works, but I say this for Yale. We have to become more boundaryless within the university first. And if we start practicing that and teach that to the students, I think we'll end up with more business-ready students than they are today. Well, even though you're not an insider, you clearly have a very good <laughs> <laughs> insights uh, from the inside um, through your board work, uh, among other things. So I appreciate that candid uh, response. And uh, there's a lot we do need to work on, um, mm. all of us. Um, well, I wanted to open it up, make sure that the audience had a chance. And I think we have uh, Tony and Brandon, two of our fine uh, MBA students who are going to help uh, with the microphones around here. So um, the questions. Question there. I think question there, okay. the first question. Mm. Hello, my name is Nikta Jain, and I'm a first year MBA student. Uh, my question is, um, there is still not enough representation of women in the C-suit. Um, I wanted to know what kind of challenges or barriers did you have to face to make your way to the top? And how did you navigate through the varied perspectives around women in the world which is highly dominated by men? You know, I tell you, um, the times that I rose through the corporate ladder and today's times are different. In fact, I'd say, I'd say that of my two daughters, um, we're in a much more diverse environment today. More women have entered business schools. Um, the environment is so much better. Uh, in those days, even when I was at the Boston Consulting Group in the Chicago office, there were two women, okay? Two women. I think BCG Worldwide must have had five or ten women. It wasn't a place where women, you know, existed in large numbers. Uh, even business schools didn't graduate as ma many women as we do today in business schools. Um, in those days, women had to perform so much better than men in order to move ahead. We had no choice. Some of it holds true even today, but those days it was much worse. I'd say an average number I always throw out was women had to be 50% better than men to move ahead. I remember uh, when I was at BCG, my sister was at McKinsey, and at 3 a.m. in the morning, I'd be calling her at McKinsey. I'd be sitting in the BCG office. The two of us would still be working. All the guys had gone home, but <laughs> because we had to be 50% better than men to move ahead. That's life, you know. We had to uh, accept it. But let me give you the flip side of it. So at every point, you worked harder than the men. You moved forward. But the best mentors I had through my life were men. Um, in this country, I'm talking about particularly. In many ways, I would say I represent the meritocracy that exists here. Um, I cannot imagine a foreign-born person from a developing or emerging market going into any other country and becoming CEO of a large company there. 
only in the United States. And that's because here I had so many mentors that decided to step up and guide me and tell me what I was doing wrong and what I needed to do better. And there was, there was a lot I had to learn. So over time, I was willing to learn, and I was willing to go off and build on their learnings. So I think navigating your way through this, to get to the C-suite is about you being open to ideas and changing and evolving. And when you do that and you demonstrate competence, people want to be your mentor. So they'll emerge from the woodwork and help you. It's not easy, but it can be done. Yeah. Hi. My name is Albertina Brett, and I'm an alum with an MBA in marketing and a Master of Science in International Business uh, from 98. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, how does PepsiCo foster an environment that remains innovative and creative given the competitive landscape, such as the declining diet sodas? And then my second question, how are employees encouraged to re remain fresh or innovative in their careers? Great questions. Um, first of all, um, we have to remain innovative in order to grow. And if our top line doesn't grow, the company is not going to be successful. So it becomes a survival. It becomes a, uh, you know, every quarter we have to report results. So we have a scorecard every quarter for the whole world to see. And the whole world knows exactly what we're doing to drive the top line. And the only way you can drive top line is through innovation. So innovation becomes not something we do in the evenings. Innovation is about who we are. Innovation and execution are the two hallmarks of the company. So everybody in PepsiCo knows the value of innovation. The question is, what kind of innovation? Um, as Al mentioned, as I talked about it, uh, 15 years ago, it was innovating along soft drinks and you know, snacks. I think today, you innovate across the entire spectrum. So for us, we don't care if diet sodas go down because something else picks up. Uh, in our company today, worldwide, less than 20% is Pepsi. So we have such a diverse portfolio doesn't matter what grows. If the healthy part grows, that's great. If the fun for you grows, that's fine. So what we do is we give you, the consumer, the choice. You decide what you want to buy. What we don't want you to do is to say, if I want the healthy product, it doesn't taste as good as the indulgent product, because we want both to taste great. We don't want to tell you that you've got to pay more for healthy products, because we want to affordably price it. And we don't want to make it a treasure hunt. We want to make it ubiquitously available. That's all we work on. And after that, it's completely up to you. It's a consumer choice. So our innovation is really driven along those three dimensions. And everybody in PepsiCo is focused on top line growth. One of our CEOs said some time ago, for PepsiCo, as it is for many companies, growth is oxygen. And if we don't have that growth, we don't have the oxygen to remain alive. So it's in our DNA. There's a question there. Hello, my Hi name there. is Daniela Gomez. I am a junior majoring in operations management and minoring in sustainability and business analytics. And my question for you is, what is one mistake that you would advise every young person to make? What is one mistake I'd advise you to make? Look, uh, as a mom, I'd like to tell you, don't make mistakes, please. Because <laughs> when you make a mistake and you hurt, we hurt too. Okay, But that's just the mom in me. Let me tell you. Um, the, my best learnings came from failures I've had. Failures because of mistakes. Okay? Uh, and so um, I'd, I'd suggest you do a few things. Put your hand up for the most difficult assignment. Okay? People always put their hands up for the easy assignment, for the sexy assignment. Put your hand up for a turnaround. Put your hand up to do an assignment that nobody else has done. You may fail, but you'll learn a lot from it and you'll leave a mark. I'm not answering your question directly, but I'm kind of answering it, okay? So um, mistakes which lead to failures are ways to learn. So go seek them in a way, okay? Seek out-of-the-box experiences that have an equal chance of failing as it does succeeding, because you'll be a better person for it, okay? Thank you. My name is Lana Bronopolsky. I'm a first year MBA student focusing on entrepreneurial finance. Thanks for being here. You touched on this a little bit, but can you talk more about the role that mentors have had in your life? And then for those of us looking for mentors, what criteria would you use to find the right fit? Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think I wouldn't be here today but for mentors. Okay? And they were not easy. Uh, 
Mentors are difficult because if somebody decides to mentor you, if you don't listen to them, they drop you like a hot potato. Because mentors pick you, you can't pick them. When you pick somebody and say, be my mentor, you're just asking somebody to be part of your advisory group. A real mentor picks you because they too look good when they hitch themselves to your wagon. And the reason they do that is because they see something in you is worth their time to invest in. But with mentors, you have to listen to them. You have to keep them informed. Okay? And you've, if you choose to ignore a piece of advice they gave you, go back and tell them why you chose not to listen to them. Because then you're giving them the respect that they deserve for being your mentors. Okay? So when people ask me, will you be my mentor? Strange people write to me regularly saying, will you be my mentor? I don't know what it is. You know, can you give me some advice? That's a different question. Can you be my mentor? No. I think the new thinking is mentors have got to stop just being mentors, but ac actively sponsor people. So we not just have to, if I decide I'm going to be Tony's mentor, OK? Tony's my general counsel. Not that he needs mentoring, but let's just say I decide to mentor you. It's not just mentoring him. I'm going to have to sponsor him. I'm going to have to go around the company saying, let me tell you what a great guy Tony is. Let's consider him for a bigger position. So mentors now have to take a more active role to being sponsors. So all that I say to you is my life has been enriched and got me here because of mentors, but it's a two-way relationship, not a one-way relationship. Hello. Hi there. Um, hi, how are you? My name is Mark Davis. I'm a junior majoring in management. In 2009, you challenged other executives to provide healthier foods for Americans. Over the past six years, what has PepsiCo specifically done to achieve this goal, and how has it impacted the business overall? The business has gotten better, all right? Um, portfolio is more diverse. Uh, the portfolio is um, de-risked, if you want to call it that. So, you know, we're indifferent what sells. Um, you know, but more importantly, PepsiCo is part of the Healthy Weight Commitment Foundation, which is where we issued the challenge for food and beverage companies in the U.S. to step up to make our whole food supply healthy. A bunch of us companies got together. We committed to taking out one and a half trillion calories from the diet by 2050. One and a half trillion calories as an industry. Uh, with 2010 as a base, I think. By 2013, we had already taken out 6.4 trillion calories. 6.4 trillion calories. So when companies put their heart and minds to it, can be done. It's not that we made products taste bad. Um, products still tasted good. We just consciously went about taking down salt levels, fat levels, sugar levels, without giving up taste. And that's what we've done in PepsiCo, too, across our product portfolio. We reduced sodium levels. We eliminated trans fats. We are reducing saturated fats, reducing the sugar content, offering healthier products. And it hasn't impacted the bottom line negatively. In fact, it's positively impacted us because it's allowed us to keep the top line growing. And if the top line grows, the bottom line grows. Now, tell you the flip side of doing those products. We have to take a predominantly fun for you oriented employee base that love doing great Pepsi commercials and telling them, got to promote Quaker, got to promote Tropicana. May not be Britney Spears dancing or Michael Jackson dancing to Tropicana. Or, uh, but you know what? You've got to make it as aspirational as Pepsi. And that's the challenge we have internally. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mrs. Snowy. Good um, afternoon. I'm Karun Akar. I'm a first year uh, in the MBA program. Uh, my question for you is, what challenges did you face as a professional from a developing country? Um, how did you face these challenges, and what suggestions do you have for uh, international students specifically? Um, lots and lots. I mean, I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, look, the first thing is um, communication skills. And I say this with all humility. Um, when we come from a different country, and we choose to come and live and work and study in the United States, we have to be understood oral and written communications. I was very lucky to go to the Yale School of Business because we had a very interesting program at SOM, School of Management. 
you couldn't graduate from the first year and get to the second year if you didn't pass the oral and written communications program. The first time in my life I failed both courses. First time in my life I ever failed a course and devastated me. But again, going back to the other question you asked, the best thing that happened to me. Because I went back and I realized that uh, when I was growing up and growing up in the community I was in in India, we spoke too fast and the brain worked at the same clock speed. So now you come here where you're asked to slow down your rate of speech, your brain clock speed is still ahead of your speech and so is out of sync. So you're swallowing words, you're skipping lines, and nobody can understand what you're saying. Um, second thing is uh, our writing skills were not as logical and as elegant and understandable as it needs to be in the business world. Sort of an inductive logic. You know, tell them what you're going to tell them, then tell it, and then tell them what you said you would tell them. You know, that sort of clear logic wasn't there. I was used to telling the story about the blue sky and everything else and then ultimately saying, let me tell you why I told you all this. It's because of this terrible writing skill, okay? The nuns taught me that in Catholic school. I'm going to blame it on them. <laughs> but I had to unlearn all of that, all of that. And man, it was tough. But it did wonders because all of a sudden, you know, you could sync up your mouth and your brain and you could make yourself be understood. You were writing in a more logical, clear way, stood you in great stead. Second thing is how you dress. I mean, look, when you don't have much money, you gravitate to buying many clothes that don't fit well, rather than a couple of outfits that fit well. But nobody was there to teach us then. We didn't have career development services like all business schools have today. In those days, you know, you went out and bought your own clothes. And I remember going to the equivalent of Kmart in New Haven, Kresge's, and buying the most god-awful suit. If I think about it, somebody asked me if I still have it. You can put it on eBay and sell it. I think it. I saw in the Smithsonian. It was that. so bad. <laughs> oh, God, no. Even the Smithsonian would have rejected it. It was so bad that I bought it. was shocking. But that's all I had, money to buy. Nobody was there to guide me. So all that I tell you is spend your money wisely. Buy two well-fitting, decent outfits than four outfits that don't fit and just look awful. Because if you buy two well-fitting outfits, you've got four out of it, right? You can mix and match the trousers. <laughs> and I learned all this later, OK? So all I tell you is, as you're starting out, watch other people around you dress like them talk like them, not exactly like them, but learn from them, okay? Well, I think, unfortunately, that's our last um, question. And I, I hate to end with a female CEO with fashion advice. It okay. seems like the, <laughs> the wrong ending, but <laughs> we appreciate it nonetheless. I just wanted to say um, thank you so much for coming in today, Pleasure. visiting with us. I know it's meant to, a lot to us as um, students and faculty and staff, and we really appreciate the insights. And we have a small uh, token of appreciation um, ah. for you. So thank you so thank much. Thank you very much, Alex. Very nice to be here. Thank you.